My name is Andrew, this is Graham. We are developers of Catcher, Tim and I. Um, uh, I'm going to do the pitch about uh, we're hiring Drupal developers and anyone with any kind of knowledge of Drupal at the moment. So <laughs> come see us or uh, the knowledge of the event we are hiring online. Yeah. Surely sure you're at the wrong conference. <laughs> Um, and today we're going to be talking about uh, BDD, um, which is Behaviour Driven Development. Uh, I'm going to be doing the first part of the talk. I'm going to be talking about sort of the high level of, of BDD, what BDD is, what physical value it gives to you. And uh, Graham's going to be talking about the uh, business side and general starts in my demo. So, 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 uh, <laughs> so um, I'm going to do a quick uh, hello to everyone. Are we, are we mainly, mainly developers here, or have we got some mix of developers and product owners? Or Actually, it'd be good before we start, just like quick hands up. Who has like no clue what BDD is? <laughs> and then who has like, who is actually using BDD? Or? Okay. Are the guys using BDD? Are you all developers? Have we got anyone doing a kind of normal way of the best apps the other day? Um, isn't that okay. a good Okay, so um, BDD essentially uh, described like this is a quite good system. Second generation, outside in, full base, multiple state number, multiple scale, high automation, agile methodology. <laughs> so, we're going to try and unpack that in the next uh, three or four minutes to explain where you do get your benefit from this uh, methodology and what actually it is. So, let's go back and try and understand the problem we're trying to solve. And essentially, it's quite a fundamental thing, it's language. So, when you're kind of communicating business requirements between a client or a stakeholder and a developer or a QA guy, then there's all sorts of scope for miscommunications. So everyone's kind of played Chinese whispers or done that thing in Google Translate where you kind of type in a word, translate it to Japanese, and then translate it back again, and it doesn't come out the same. So every time you communicate something, there's the potential for kind of losing some context, losing meaning, getting things screwed up. And we do see this all the time. You know, everyone's had this thing where you know the client has said, oh, "I want a search button here or widget there," and you thought you know what they mean, and then you kind of come to implement it and show it to them, and they say, "Oh, we can need that. We meant a search engine, a search widget that does this, or a, a, a thingy that does that." And so they, the the miscommunication there isn't with it isn't anyone's fault in particular. It's just the, the fact that we're using a, a kind of suboptimal method of translating ideas, which is language, we're kind of constantly mediated through this kind of um, power of language, which is great for writing things down, but when you try and express complex ideas, it can be a bit uh, tricky and things can get lost. So there is this assumption that when something is stated in a meeting or in a requirements document, or in a, in a meeting with things with UCMs, which are use cases, um, that everyone who's going to read that UCM or everyone's going to re read that requirement knows exactly what the original intention was. And the consequences of these miscommunicated ideas is basically labeling products, things that the client can really want. And we've all been there and delivered that. For sure. So, why not test your requirement? Why behavioral group pain development? So TDD is uh, great for doing inside out testing. So you <laughs> test classes, you test methods, you test functions. And that's great. And that's working, that works very well for the, the deep kind of level that developers tend to work on. It doesn't necessarily mean anything to a uh, product owner. You can't necessarily uh, show them um, a test of a function that it writes to a that it writes something to a database and that, that database is, is written correctly to. That doesn't necessarily mean anything to their real world business problems. So you know you they might want to see uh, feedback on a web page or they might, might want to see uh, something that has business value rather than necessarily doing the things that we tend to do when we do TDD, which is to 
get right down to the very small level and minute level and actually look at things like um, individual you know, code exceptions and things like that. Maybe. So there's this problem about group and reader. It's, 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 so if, you, if you're looking at a list of requirements and you're, you're writing a unit test, there's a big disjoint there between what the client actually wants and what the unit tests are testing. They're, they're essentially testing two different classes of thing. So BDD, it takes the best thing to test your development, where the tests are like the test first, and they're repeatable, they're automated, highly reusable, fast, but also takes ideas from domain-driven design. Now, domain-driven design is something that uh, a business analysts, people like that sort of ilk would use, and it describes problems in terms of that the business stakeholders understand. So, for instance, it tends to speak about things in terms of business value, um, in terms of Rather than in terms of uh, you know, methods, classes, modules in, in, in the drift world, it'll, it'll talk of things like uh, searches, shopping carts, things like that. Some things, things that uh, businesses are quite happy talking about and got knowledge about. And there might be some implicit jargon in there. So they might talk about a particular type of page. They may talk like a gateway page that is understood by the entire business, but isn't necessarily well understood by developers or by uh, <coughs> testing, for instance. Um, but what the main of design that gives us is uh, the idea of having a common or <coughs> as they call it, language for, that everyone can understand, that everyone can refer to. And that is sort of the level that you, that you talk about. So everyone in the project should be able to understand that language, whether they're a business stakeholder, whether they're the client's boss, whether they're the client, whether they're developers, or whether they're test teams. So it takes the two. It takes the kind of the best things from, from these two kind of uh, two, two areas, and we've got kind of support tools there. So we've got um, friends who demonstrate some of these that later on, but there's Gherkin, the Act, Jenkins, Vera, Source, and many others. So we've got this kind of good, uh, robust level of support within the group on PHP for this. So. Essentially, we, we kind of move away from this kind of siloed development practice <coughs> where you might have, um, you might have uh, okay, the clients and BAs or, or that sort of side of the, the business side of things coming up with a list of requirements and then throwing over the wall to a bunch of developers to develop. Rather than do that, we have this thing called conversation whereby you get developers, you get business analysts, you get uh, the clients all together in the same room and you can talk about the, uh, the problems, you can talk about that they're, trying to, that they're trying to solve, you can talk about potential, uh, potential solutions to the problems. Because what happens is when you get these different types of people in the room, you find out that there are different ways for look, look, approaching different uh, problems. Uh, people come up with um, different uh, experiences, different backgrounds, different ways, different uh, ways of looking at things. But also, what it does is it smooths out this kind of uh, this kind of um, interface between the business and the and the uh, solution, so that people can understand when there's jargon being used. For instance, there might be some you know piece of jargon that everyone in the business assumes that everyone should know about. And by upfronting this at the beginning, before any development work has been done during the conversation, then everyone is uh, made explicitly aware of what these bits of jargon actually really mean and what they actually apply for the product that you're building. And out of this comes um, what we call feature, which is kind of a, a general uh, kind of set of uh, requirements. Like, so you might wander around with certain <coughs> Uh, and within those uh, features, we end up with this, with this uh, set of these things called scenarios, which everyone's kind of should be familiar. These kind of look a bit like um, user stories, but they're in, a, in a, a set form. So basically, given some context, when something happens, then I expect something happened and business value. And this is a key thing here. Right? You've got 
a particular context that's well known that everyone understands, a particular set of steps, and then something that adds business value. So, because that's, that's the key thing we're doing here, we're not doing, just building software for the fun of it, we're you know, adding, giving a business or whoever we're working for value. Um, and, and in this, you know, being engaged in this conversation, you can ask questions that won't necessarily be apparent to the business. So, you, you could say, well, given this context, when, some, when the similar thing happens, what else should I expect to be seeing on screen, or what else, what other activities should also be happening? So everyone becomes a bit more aware of, rather than just having a list of requirements of things you might want to happen, the developers can kind of understand under what different uh, context, what different uh, uh, actions, other things might happen. An example of this is this here. So this is a bit more concrete example. When I'm on the gateway page, also, given I'm on the gateway page when I log in as Fred Smith, then I expect to be on the Fred Smith's user account page. So you can unpack this. Um, this is kind of an example of this ubiquitous language that the main driven design gives us. The gateway page isn't just some notional URL, it's something that's got function, it's got a, it's got a use for in the, in, in, the, in the business. And all the people along in the project understand what this gateway page is and what it's for. It's not just URL that happens to be sitting on your site. It's got a particular, uh, it's got a particular use for the marketing team, for the sales team, whoever. You've got a persona here, Fred Smith, and we know, for instance, Fred Smith is a, a special type of user who's got a membership number and he's got a certain number of points that he can spend or something, that sort of thing. He's got a persona, so we know that it's not just a, a random user that logs in. And again, like with the gateway page, we know what the user account page should be, we know what the URL should be. Testing out this is it's a specification. It also works as documentation. So it's basically this is documenting your site. Because once you've all come together and come together with these and produce these scenarios and features, you've essentially got a list of uh, uh, full documentation of how the site should behave. And it's also, the best thing about this is it's actually an automated test. So it's an automated test that the business can see, the business can understand, unlike a <coughs> test. You can show this to any kind of non-technical uh, user, and they will understand what's going to be happening here. They can understand what this test is going to be doing, and they can understand when it's going to fail, when it's going to pass, just like developers can, just like a test team can, just like a support team can, you know, two years after your site's gone live, they can understand, they can read this as specification, documentation, and as a test. So it kind of encompasses a full length of your project, but it also is very it's concise, and it's also easy to understand. So shortly, Graham's going to show you how to uh, how this is an automated test, because a lot of people, when they sort of see this, they don't believe this can be automated at all. So, <coughs> okay. so going back to our original slide, it's second generation because it kind of follows on from TDD and this sort of thing. It's outside in because it's rather than it looks at the, 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 the site or the product as a whole from the outside, from the user's perspective, rather than the <coughs> kind of visual bits of code that, build, that, uh, that are built up using that. Uh, it's pull based, which means you can use it in a kind of, uh, uh, kind of agile methodology way. You could use, you could you know, sort of pull these stories in and do them just in time rather than doing big upfront design that quite often happens. Multiple stakeholder, because all stakeholders can hopefully understand these scenarios and stories. Uh, multiple scale, which is quite evident. High automation, because you can run these stories through tests, uh, test runners, and and the hack which you've got brains going to be showing you. And it's an agile methodology because you can re you can iterate over these so you can change these. They're, they're very small, these stories tend to be, they can be uh, changed very quickly and then the feedback is a continuous integration which is <coughs> part of uh, the agile way. I think with that we're going to hand over to Brad. Okay, so now we're going to get down to some code, and I'm going to show you how you can set up um, the hack, make, get up in, and how you can integrate and automate some of that 
for things like Soft Labs and Travis and Judah and hot products that have funny names. Um, so all you need to be able to set this up is PHP 5.3 and I'm sure everybody's using at least PHP 5.3 on their projects by now and if you're not, upgrade already. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, you so, can say that since January. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you, I'm going to talk about how to install Behat, which is um, a framework that's built upon the Symfony framework, um, and it's used to kind of uh, automate and, and uh, run uh, some of these tests that Andrew's um, already shown you. So the first thing you need um, to set this up is, um, so Behat uses the Composer uh, Package Manager for PHP. Um, you need to have a composer.json file. Um, and here is a list of packages um, that I want to install. Um, you can search for packages on packages.org. Um, uh, so some of the things I'm going to install is Behat uh, itself. Uh, I'm going to install Mink and I'll come on to speak about what <coughs> Mink is um, a bit later. Um, I'm going to install Selenium, um, Sahi, Zombie. These are different um, types of uh, browsers um, based on Mink, which again I'll come on to soon. Um, there's also some uh, work that's already been done by people in the Drupal community. So there's a Drupal extension for the hack you can use. Um, again, I'll come on to that. Uh, and some, some other things in the list is uh, integration with softlabs.com, which is a cloud-based um, browser uh, testing facility. Um, I'll show you again later how that kind of works. Um, so once you've got your composer.json file, um, you just run these three commands um, from the command line, and that will download all the packages um, to your machine, um, Install them and running the hat dash dash init will initialize a set of blank files for you. Um, so it creates a features folder, which is where you put your uh, texts, which are written in the kind of English style language. Um, you must have a feature context file, which is a class. Um, again, I'll, I'll show you kind of how that how that looks when we dive into some code uh, soon. Um, the Drupal extension will be hacked. You can you can check it out here. Um, what it does is it provides its own um, uh, context class, um, and it gives you some scaffolding and some functions um, that you can use uh, to build upon it. it. Integrates with things like Drush. And, and kind of you can extend it, and I'll, I'll, again, I'll come down to that when we come to the code. Um, so you, if you want to create your own class, then you can uh, just extend the Drupal one, and you get all of the, the goodness that people have already made, and that will show you what that looks like. If you were in Alex's CMI talk just before this one, um, you probably heard him speak about, a bit about YAML. Um, Behat uses YAML, um, and in fact it uses uh, other stuff similar to CMI, so it uses things like the container um, because it is built upon the Symfony framework. Um, you need to create a behat.yaml file in order to set um, Behat up. This is what it looks like. Um, I'll just go and explain a bit about what, 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 what each part of the file is. Um, so, the top, um, the features in the bootstrap, that's just the path to where um, your, your tests are sitting. Um, so it's just a folder that, and that is already created in here by default, so it just points it out. Um, the context and parameters, that is, that's something that you can pass into the, the test framework. So here um, I've, I've passed in the concept of a, an admin user. And I'm passing in the username and, and the password of that admin user, and I can use that within tests. Um, and I'll show you a test that is using this admin user and how you can kind of build that into your tests. Um, here we've just said we want to, the default browser to be good, which is a browser that um, is different from Selenium and that it, it doesn't work with JavaScript. So 
it's a non-JS version, a non-JS browser. Um, and I've said below that for JavaScript sessions, I want to use Selenium 2 because it supports JavaScript and Goot does. And this is, I'm going to talk a little bit about how Mink works and these different browsers and, and what that means. Um, so Mink is basically, it's a browser abstraction <coughs> on, uh, that plugs into the hat. So, um, whereas if you just had a Selenium test, um, you, you can only run that Selenium test through Selenium and you're tied to that. Um, with Mink, um, you're, not, you're not tied to a single browser. Um, so you, you can mix and match how you want and you can, you can do that within your test. Um, so here I've said I'm, I'm going to use two. I'm going to use Goot because it's quicker, um, because it doesn't it's quicker than Selenium, but it doesn't support JavaScript. But for um, JavaScript, uh, I want to use Selenium. And inside a test, if you just tag your test with uh, tag app JavaScript, the app knows that that should automatically run that test in Selenium. If you don't, then it's by default it's going to use Goot. That's a pretty good question. During a test, can you jump between the two different browsers? So you you, uh, you start off doing a whole bunch of stuff in Goo because it's quick, and then you've got to do something that has JavaScript and click over to Selenium. Would it share sessions and stuff like that between the two browsers? Or, it no? won't share sessions, I don't think. Um, you can jump in between by tagging different scenarios with JavaScript, or the other way to do it is by having some custom code in your feature context class that um, gets a specific browser driver and uses it for like certain step and stuff like yeah. that. That's, that's the two ways that you can kind of do that. Um, Andrew talked a little bit about um, what feature tests look like um, earlier. Um, the Behat website itself is quite good. The documentation on <coughs> it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, here's how you kind of write a feature that kind of builds on what Andrew spoke about earlier. Um, so, this feature is uh, one that I've written, um, I'm going to demo in a second uh, um, this actually running. So I've got an install of the Commerce Kickstart on my machine, and this is a feature that, that I've written um, around Commerce Kickstart, and I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Um, these scenarios will uh, get run. Um, does anybody have any questions before I skip on about features and oh, I just keep going. Okay, good. Um, so, so once you've kind of got your features and, and tests, sweet. Um, there, then you can execute them via the command line. Um, now I'm going to kind of go into a live demo. <laughs> Hopefully, it doesn't break. So, can everybody see this? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so, um, here's what I've installed the app. Um, I've got two features, two tests. I've got one, which is the one you just saw, and I've got another, which tests the user login. Um, here you can see at the bottom of the user login where I'm, I'm using that uh, variable that was added as a parameter into the app for the admin user. Uh, um, here. Um, so obviously if you're doing this a true behavior in a way, then you would write all these tests up front for your development so they would all fail. And then as your team develops the site, they would gradually pass. And you can use these tests as kind of acceptance tests. Um, um, so you can kind of sign off um, based on that. So that, that's, that's the simplest way to kind of run the text just by executing the, the hack command. It'll automatically run everything in that folder that you have. Um, you, can, you, you can pass parameters in as well. So um, we just go back to look at the text. So here I've tagged the user login text with a user tag and a login tag. So you can, you can run tests by, by tag by doing 
this. Um, that's just going to use run the single, the single uh, tags. So you can group tests um, by tags and execute them like that. Um, other ways of kind of slicing and dicing this is by having different YAML files. Um, I, I don't have another YAML file here with different, but how you can, I'll show you quickly how you do that. If you just pass like the config to another YAML file, dot YAML, <laughs> then if you, you can set up that to, to kind of include tags, and, and so you can have various different YAML files, and, and you can kind of slice and dice like that. Um, so that, that's kind of how you have a test and execute it with the hack. Um, I'll go on to kind of how you can start to integrate that with other things. Um, so the, the, the first thing I'll show you is kind of, uh, has anybody has everybody heard of Jira before? Um, it's like an issue management tool. Um, so if you look at Jira, you've got a Jira here which basically has um, a user login test um, in, in the system. Um, so the, there's actually an extension um, for the hat that, that plugs into the plugs into Jira and because Jira has an API, um, what you can do is uh, you can you can use the plugin um, I'll show you briefly how that so if we go back to the hat or YAML file and say I want to include another YAML file which is a Jira one. If we look at that. It basically has, um, I'm not going to show you the geo credentials or YAML. Um, <laughs> um, this is the geo plugin and it's got some configuration options. The JQL bit is like the Jira query language. Um, so it's going to look up the Jira API for features that start with kickstart feature. Um, if you just run the hat, um, with no parameters and point it to your Jira, it will automatically pick up every feature that is tagged like that. Um, it also has a couple of other options that you can turn on and off, like it can leave comments uh, if, it's, if it's, the test is passed or failed inside Jira. Um, so you, as I said, you can either like have it run everything in your Jira by configuring the JQL part, or you can uh, run specific Jira um, issues by doing the, uh, so yeah, so the issue is DL1. So that's actually pulled it down from Jira now and it's executing that against my local site. So you don't have to have all your tests sitting in files. You can have uh, your business analysts or your client or whatever, just put them into Jira. And, and you can pick them up and, and run them. It's pretty cool. Um, so that's the kind of Jira integration. Um, the next thing I want to talk about uh, was Soft Labs. Five minutes? Okay, so I'll speed up a bit. Um, so Soft Labs is like cloud based for the testing. Um, and it basically how it manages like boxes of like different operating systems and browser, so you can say, um, if I just get back to the presentation, that's um, Jira. Um, so here's a couple of URLs. Um, the browser one, I'll give you a list of all the supported um, operating system and browser um, configurations by Jira. Um, Soft Connect is basically a, a plugin that allows you to set up a secure tunnel between yourself and soft lab. So if you're working on a site um, that is in like a private network that can't be accessed from the public internet, then you can set up a tunnel between your um, test site and soft lab, and that allows them to see your site and it's secure, um, and that allows them to test. So I'll show you kind of how that works. Um, so I've got a tunnel set up here in this area between my dev machine and soft lab. Um, YAML. So I'm going to include the soft.yaml which basically says I've got 
So these things down here are different profiles. I'll show you how they run. Um, so I've set up like an IE9 profile of Firefox 19. You can use Android or iPad, that kind of all the things you do. So if I go up here. <clears throat> so what that's actually done, that's that is communicating with Source Lab and if I go to my test, you should see that now we have a test that's running in Source Lab. Through the text. Um, it's actually capturing a live video of the entire text that's happening on, to, on my machine. So that's at, the, the software cloud is actually connected to my local MacBook and it's testing my local site. It's going to capture a, a video of the entire text, it captures a screenshot at, at every stage of the text. Um, so it's, I think it's pretty awesome and it's pretty powerful. And, and you can automate all this um, just from the command line, and you can, you can have this integrated with your Jenkins server or any kind of CI server, and you can have this running on commit, or you can have it running on overnight builds. Um, it's up to you, really. Um, so yeah, that, that's going to carry on. That's going to that's do the test. Um, It takes a bit longer because it's going through the tunnel and everything, but um, you, you, you can kind of, there's options to like increase the performance by having to exclude certain types of files or not like <coughs> exclude certain domains out of like requests, like you don't want to pick up the Google <coughs> Analytics file and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of briefly how you can integrate with Jira and with Soft Labs. Um, if, if you want to basically find out a bit more, um, you, can, you can clone this GitHub repository, um, which basically is integrated with Travis and it has a common kickstart build make file in there. And what's happening there is that every time I push to the GitHub repository, um, Travis, which is a uh, uh, continuous integration um, services uh, linked to GitHub is building the entire Drupal Commerce Kickstart site and it's executing um, the, the behalf tests against it via Source Labs um, and it's, it's capturing a video of that. And because um, this is a public repository, um, the Source Labs uh, has an open source option which is free for anybody that's working on um, open source projects. Um, <coughs> similarly, Travis is also free. Uh, so you get free CI and free soft labs if you are uh, working on a public GitHub repo and open source project, which is pretty cool. Um, I can probably just show you that briefly. So it says my builds are failing, but it's lying. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> passing, right? um, so yeah, this is Travis. It had the last build it built. Uh, can't see that um, yeah, so it's it's downloading. It's doing the whole composer thing. Uh, it's built inside. Uh, this is Josh Make happening here. Um, it now is going to start up the Josh built-in web server and and Josh. Uh, the latest version of Josh, which is like spins up a web server, so that site is actually running inside Travis. Um, it sets up a secure tunnel um, to Soft Labs between Travis, uh, the build box on Travis and Soft Labs, and then it starts firing off the Behat test here. If I go back to my GitHub repository, um, and you can see the Soft test. I haven't got like a full integration because it's done all of it all up. Um, and that is mm -hmm. that's basically that's it. So yeah, last slide. Is... Thank you.
can you could you use source labs for load testing? So you know you build a whole bunch of BHAP uh, tests and then tell it to spin up a hundred uh, clients and hit the server up. You could. Um, there is another extension um, for the hack. It's called Pilot Test. It allows you to do like spin up stuff in parallel, so you can um, kind of fasten the whole thing up. But you could do that. I wouldn't necessarily say it's the best tool for that kind of testing, um, but it is, it's possible. Um, there's another interesting extension. Um, which I haven't had time to play around with yet, but it integrates into the hat and it's supposed to be able to collect um, and analyze performance data along the way um, and output that to files that um, you can like pull into like Y slow and stuff. So it, it doesn't kind of give you massive performance, but it gives you like the basics like, like your request times or like what they are and 